Hey, everyone. This is Chris. And this is Lorenzo. And welcome to Hacking Your Leadership, a Spreaker Prime podcast. Thanks to all our Patreon members and our loyal listeners for tuning in today. Before we begin, here's a short message from a sponsor. Welcome to Hacking Your Leadership. I'm Chris, and welcome to today's guest interview. Our guest interviews are long-form interviews with leaders from around the world. They've each been selected because of their valuable perspective on leadership and work they've accomplished in this space. Today, we're joined by Heather Younger, the founder of Employee Fanatics, a company that uses data and metrics to help organizations improve the employee experience, and author of the book, The Art of Caring Leadership, How Leading with Heart Uplifts Teams and Organizations, a book that released yesterday and is already receiving a ton of praise from authors, CEOs, and people in academia. Welcome, Heather. Say hi to our audience. Hello there. Glad to be here. It's a pleasure having you. You know, first things first I want to start out with is that you know, you, you're an, an attorney, at least educationally, um, if not in practice, or at least not for a, a while. You know, usually when people go to school for that amount of time to do something specific like that, they spend more than just a few years in that field. So talk a little bit about the departure from that, because it seems like maybe you do less of that now. Yeah, a lot less of that. Yeah. And I was only in it for um, like two and a half years. And then I, I literally quit the practice of law. And um, so I, for, for Basically, for my childhood, I, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. I had a my backstory is uh, my mom is white and Jewish, my dad is black and Christian. I had a grandmother who was from the Bronx, and she would always call me her little lawyer. And I, um, and it's just one of those things. It was because I, um, because of that background, though, my mom's family wasn't really receptive about the marriage, and so I was really treated like an outcast and um, an, an outsider in my own family. And so when she would call me her little lawyer, it was kind of the endearing side of our relationship. And I really drove myself to go to law school and practice because of her. But it wasn't long lived because it wasn't wasn't my calling. That's a great story. What did, what was the impetus for you discovering that it wasn't your calling? Was it a, a series of events or? It were, yeah, it was a couple of things. I had, I, interestingly enough, um, while I was, I was really good at the marketing side of law. So I'd bring clients in, but I hated to deal with them afterwards. I didn't want to be doing all the research and writing all the briefs. <laughs> I loved interacting with them as people, but that was about it. Um, but then at the same time, I would go and market the firm at this uh, Boulder Chamber of Commerce events. And every time I would go, I would see this one woman who worked for Mary Kay Cosmetics. And I'm not a makeup person. I still, I still am not a makeup, big old makeup person. And so, um, and at that point I wore nothing, like maybe just like lip gloss. So she came up to me and she'd be like, oh, and she was very conversational and she was always happy. And at some point I would go to her, her meetings and I would see all these women just like doing well, being having all this uplifting conversation. And so that happened for about a year and a half. And then I, I, again, I was just getting like withering at the vine at the law firm. And I, I just saw her, she was kept, kept kind of doing light invitations. She kind of um, was acting like we were dating in a way, right? She could do light invitations and I would kind of take her own invitation. And finally I was like, you know what? I am just, I, I can't do this. I, I, this is obviously not for me. I can't be in law libraries. I can't be do, sitting with research. I need to be with people and I want to, I want what, I want what they have. So I exited the practice of law to go work for Mary Kay Cosmetics as an independent sales consultant. And, um, and yes, people always ask, did you get the car? And the answer is yes, I did. And I had a team as director and that's in that place where I was at there. I learned a couple things I learned. I learned, I learned how finicky people are when it comes to money, their money and departing from it or releasing it, let's say. And I also learned the power of uplifting other people and that leaders play that role in uplifting others. So that was kind of an early, a real early leadership lesson. It was my where my early leadership training came from is through Mary Kay Ash. She was just an amazing leader who met people where they were at all the time. So then I exited there. I was there for about four and a half years. There are a lot of people who started out the same way you started out in, in that they they find themselves in their mid to late twenties, um, you know, doing something that they didn't want to do. Um, you know, either it's because it was the expectation of family, or, or you know, you know what the the what, what the expectation was, um, or they just thought they really wanted to. But most people who find themselves in that situation, they grin and bear it. They put another twenty five or thirty years into that unhappily, and they try to fill their lives with other things that make them happy and compartmentalize it all out. And, you know, you didn't, you know, you, you did something different. What, what was, what was it in you that led you to do that? Cause that's not, I don't think that's as common as, as you might think it is. Over the years, I I've come to this real realization that I'm called to do what I'm supposed to be doing. So like every step along the way has 
has put me in the place I'm at. Like, for example, when I was practicing law, the only area that ever interested me was employment law. Um, I, I, I was very intrigued by the employer-employee relationship and the power dynamic that existed between the two. And so, like, my first book on the seven intuitive laws of employee loyalty was kind of a culmination. It was like bringing that forward into co- combining the legal side and then, of course, the, the view that I have on kind of the soft side of relationships inside the workplace. Um so, yeah, I mean, I, I think it was just I felt I wasn't feeling called to do it. I did it. I realized that the the that I was doing it for approval. I was doing it to be accepted. And and there was a stark reality that happened that I just uh, it wasn't that was never going to happen. And I wasn't going to be fully be accepted. And so because of that, I just you know what? I I know I'm meant to do more than this. I know that I, there's just something more in me and I'm not going to let these people, whether it be, um, you know, my family or anybody else, determine that for me. What was it about the employment uh, side of things, not just employment law, but you say you, your words, the the relationship between the employee and the employer. What what was it about that that was so intriguing to you? Well, again, it's that power dynamic that exists between the employer and the, and the employee, the kind of the, con- the the implied contract that exists and the expectations on both sides and how how often, you know, both sides break the the implied contract that exists there so there's these ideas these are these things that employees are wanting when they take the role it's not you know some, it may initially be money but then it's like oh their mission is something like pretty cool i can like get involved in that that's like that that actually aligns with my values i actually like their leadership team right so there's all these things that start to like pop for us as we go to employers and um and so that 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 that's the area the area of relationships ends up being a really big part of it so i, I think employee experience is driven by emotions and so that everything that we do from the big, before they even join the firm to when they leave um, along that employee journey, that journey that they take with us means uh, we, we need to be focusing on every touch point. And then it's the experience that we have. I, I always say, and I say even in this next book, that the, the gauge for employees on whether the experience is good, whether their experience with you as a leader is good, whether their experience with your organization is good, is how they gauge it. It's them. They are the end user of the experience. So you can say all day you care, um, which is we started off with this idea. So from our book, we started off with this idea of a, a um, self-assessment, a caring leadership self-assessment that would they we then recommend that they use a coach to work with them. But what what our intent is, is by the end of the year or by next year is to roll out an employee version so that their team, if they're courageous enough, they will then allow their team members to kind of do a let's let's see. I thought I was this. They've worked with the coach. Are they really this? So they're going to be judged uh, spot on by their team. Uh, and there has to be to, in order for them to want to do that, they have they have to have already created trust and safe spaces with them. Uh, right. And and if they didn't create the safe space where people can like psychological safety, where they can talk about all these things in an open way that it's not going to make them feel like they're about to be fired. But in the end, if you really want to get better as a leader, you have to be open to all those things. So I, the answer, the long and short of it is, is yes, that 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 there's so much more about emotion, relationship, safety, belonging, inclusion, like all of these things that you think that you hear now, so much of that. It's just in between all of the the lines. Um, I call them brushstrokes of what how leaders show up. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Um, obviously, people, the, these things that we're talking about, about the, the things that the employees are looking for out of their employers, they, I think, over the last maybe t- 10 to 20 years have transitioned from a nice to have to a cost of admission. You know, so it used to be that maybe an employee would, you know, kind of weigh everything. And it's like, well, you know, this checks off these these two boxes, maybe not these, but you know, these two are really important. You know, there's just a lot less of that kind of willingness to compromise on any of those things that, you know, employees, they want growth and development. They want to have good relationships with the people they work alongside. You know, it's just all of these things that say, I'm not satisfied with devoting 30 or 40 or 50 plus hours a week of my life into something that doesn't really check all the boxes for me. It's just too much of my life to do that for without myself being happy. I'm not okay with saying, well, this checks off some of them and then I'll go home and be happy with my friends and my family and other stuff. It's got to be all of it. Um, You know, that to me really puts a lot of responsibility on the employer to kind of um, to check all those boxes for the employee or, you know, when we've seen obviously turnover is just really, really high right now. People stay at jobs two, three years the most sometimes. 
um, clearly there's a shortage of these things you're talking about. Yeah, I would have to say that. And when we think about, I know a lot of the stuff I talk about can sound super overwhelming, but, but I think when we think about what the requirement is for the employer to kind of keep the employee happy, um, but I think there's a, there's something that we you know want to make sure that we mention, and that is also that there's a responsibility on the, on the part of the employee. That's why I said that whole dynamic between the employer-employee when you think about the implied contract, there's all these things that the the organization needs from the employee too, um, and that the, and that of course then the leader need they need from the leaders, and so the, it, it is a bi-directional relationship. There's no doubt. I mean, you can't have a leader trying to go out of their way to listen or to to build trust, and then the employee has no receptivity to it. So there's that imbalance of power that exists, and so there is going to be uh, because there is more power on the employer side, there is going to be this need for them to kind of shoulder more of the burden of the relationship. But the employee does have a role to. Play. So I totally get what you're saying there. I kind of like this though. So from the standpoint of it used to be that, oh, when, when, whatever the power shift is, because it's hardly ever balanced. It's you, it is usually imbalanced either towards the employer or the employee side. Whenever there's an imbalance, there can be a tendency to wield the power as opposed to look at it as a responsibility. And, and, and so just to kind of transition from, you know, Hey, you know what? People want this job more than we need them. We can easily replace them. Therefore, we have to do nothing. That's that's maybe an older way of looking at things, whereas now it's, oh, we have a lot of power right now. That means we have a responsibility to make sure that we're taking care of our people because we're, we won't succeed and we won't uh, our productivity won't be high, our engagement won't be high, and therefore our results won't be great unless they are giving their all. And if they feel that imbalance and they feel like it's being wielded against them in terms of power, um, that's a good way for them to shut down, not to give their all to the job. Exactly. Yeah. I, it's, it, I, I think that's interesting when you talk about, because I really haven't spoken lately about this whole imbalance thing and um, and how it kind of plays out. And I do think that there are, there are things on the side of the employer we can take this whole power dynamic out of the situation if if the if the the structure of the bureaucracy inside of organizations would change where they would if they would see their people more as equals and not as like in the subordinate like they're here to do just the job they're not here as humans to like fulfill their needs we think of maslow's hierarchy we think about all of those needs up that pyramid uh, so that base levels like safety, security and like housing and water and all those things. Right. When we get to this. Then we start to get into the places where we're looking at belonging and and love and affection and all those things. And then we get up to the top at self-actualization. And boy, if you could imagine an organization that had employees in that fully self-actualized state, what could they achieve? What would their market cap be? What would their stakeholder value look like? I mean, it's just crazy when you think about that. But we don't have that and we don't have that, which is why you and I keep talking about this stuff. Yeah. Right. Because they have to do these things like listen more effectively, have empathy and compassion for their people, uh, you know, seek to understand them, show appreciation and recognizing them, meeting them where they're at. I mean, a lot of the things that I talk about and the and the details about what that looks like and what it goes into that. They have to do all those things, which seems like a whole lot. But if you want the better market cap and you want to have the end result of more revenues and better CSAT scores, you're going to have to do the hard work. Yeah. You know, their company have kind of toyed with this idea of trying to uh, reduce or eliminate hierarchies. Zappos did, th- did it for a while in terms of, uh, you know, kind of eliminating titles and everybody kind of just does what they do. And there, there is no, there is no reporting structure and, and they saw some lift in certain areas because of this, but they have also seen some real um, declines in certain things because of it. And, and, you know, even Stanford did a study on this around the fact that people want hierarchies because for if for no other reason, they want to know what the next step is in their growth and their development. You know, they don't like the idea of a hierarchy when they have to listen to somebody, but they like the idea of a hierarchy when they need to know what their next promotion is going to be. And it doesn't work to say to them, sorry, we've eliminated hierarchies. Therefore, we've also eliminated promotions. We've also eliminated, you know, these other things. It's like, well, that's not what I want. I just wanted to kind of do what I wanted to do uh, and, and, and not have somebody tell me what to do. But I also still want to get promoted when it's time to get promoted. They don't really go together. You know, you kind of have to you, you kind of have both or neither. I, I think there's that there's a complicated, uh, you know, play that you have there, I think, with all of it, because you, you can't you can't like please everyone all the time. I think we, we want to highlight that. I mean, in the work that I do, and I'm not sure that all of the space you're in, but in the work that I do, you know, it's not about even when, for example, we do a lot of listening. We, we call it helping uh, organizations create a culture of listening. And when we are doing all that listening and all the different sessions, the idea isn't to to um, 
to please every single person in the room. The idea is to figure out what you can do as an organization to scale employee experience. So how can you how can you improve the experience for your people? And so you have to figure out what's going to help the greatest amount of people inside your organization. So uh, you know, yeah, if we're thinking from an organizational view, so I'm, this is like above organization. What do we do at the organizational level um, that makes sure that we can maybe we're impacting sixty to seventy percent of our team members and they feel like their experience is better versus like every single person. Now, when we look at the manager side of things, the the one-on-one relationship and the team relationship, now you are going, okay, what are the motivating motivations of my team members, each of them individually in their own shoes? How do I how do I know that? How do I get to the bottom of it? Do I spend time with my people? Um, and if I spend time with them and I ask them the right questions and I listen appropriately and I and I and I try to meet them where they're at and really seek to understand them, I'm going to be able to deliver for them a unique experience that um, that is going to feel more personalized. Where then the organizational level they have to look at scale and how do we create the infrastructure or the processes and systems so that the managers can kind of go in and out of them, you know, in a fluid way uh, to help improve that experience and the relationship for their their team members. This might sound kind of funny how I'm saying this because most people think this kind of work is all squishy, squishy, touchy, feely. But in fact, what it is in the background is full of processes and systems and well thought out um, strategies that produce positive emotions and feelings up front, but it's very structured in the background. I, I love that. So this is a perfect segue because I love that your answer was about the process and that there's stuff that happens behind the scenes because the, the next question I was going to ask you is if I look at the title of your book, the, the sub the subtitle of How Leading with Heart Uplifts Teams and Organizations, well, duh, right? So duh, like, and I would think that a lot of people would say the exact same thing. So um, I want to ask you, and I'm going to tease this a little bit, what what are the data and the processes behind this so that you're not just saying, yeah, lead with heart, lead with heart, uplift your teams, because everybody's going to respond with that with, well, of course, we are, or, that's the, the answer. What is actually behind that where people can go through these processes and, and figure out where they're lacking or where they're not lacking? So I want to I wanna tease that. But first, I want to uh, take it to a word from a sponsor. All right, we're here with Heather Younger, author of the new book, The Art of Caring Leadership, How Leading with Heart Uplifts Teams and Organizations. And before that break there, I asked Heather if she could tell me what is it that leaders need to do in order to lead with heart besides just saying, yeah, of course I lead with heart. I, I care. And, and you know, my, my close friends say that I care. You know, how is it that I can get validated on this with data and with processes or you know, unfortunately validate that I'm not doing everything that I need to do? Yeah. And so the, the issue here is I, I, my North Star and the North Star of my business employee fanatics is all about listening. So, uh, you know, the process that I take people through that come to me and they come to me for particular reasons because they're looking to take their culture to a new level. They want their people to be engaged. Uh, and it, they don't usually come to me asking about, I want to make more money. I want our market cap to be better. They're wanting to, they want to take their culture to the next level. They want to be known as a top workplace. That is why they work with my company. Okay. Um, but I think the, the idea here is so in, in this idea of caring and leading with heart, it's a nebulous concept. People are like, what it like care? Of course I care. Of course I lead with heart. Yeah, I, of course I, like, I I know I do. So everybody assumes that they do, and that's why it's like a duh concept. But in fact, they don't, which is why there's so much employee pain with mental health issues around the world. There's a lot of uh, issues related to employee retention, depending on your industry, can be in upwards of 75% uh, annually. So uh, if, if it was that simple and if it was actually being practiced, I wouldn't be talking about it. You and I would not have these podcasts we have if it was actually being exercised. So I would just, I would caution people to think that it's, it, it, it is simple, but it's not in practice by many. Now, in order to move this some nebulous, what I did is I interviewed um, 160 leaders and I put about 80 of their voices inside the book to, and I asked them all these different scenarios. And the exercise was an exercise on finding perfect leaders. The exercise was one on finding leaders who are more emotionally intelligent. They exhibited empathy, empathy and compassion for people. They led with heart because at the foundation of the interactions they had with their team, it was about human to human. It was about people to people. It wasn't about what project can you move forward for me? What process can you do for me? What? How can you make me look good? Now, having said that, again, they weren't perfect. And the beauty of having these conversations is how much they revealed their imperfections, but what they did in real emotionally intelligent ways to come out of it um, and not reveal themselves to be perfect in the end again, but to say, you know what, I get better every day. 
I am a leader who really uses the, 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 the pieces of art, the pieces of the, the canvas and the brushes that I have. I use my own brush strokes to create an experience for people in a way that's more emotionally intelligent. I think of them. I meet them where they're at. So as I listen to a lot of these people and all their stories, I was like, I got to like episode 25 and I'm like, there is so much brilliance here. Like I, there's no way I can leave this on a podcast only because a lot of people don't listen to podcasts. I have got to get these people's voices or stories of imperfection in a book somewhere. So that is the reason why I decided to do it. And it was like, after I listened and listened and listened, I heard it boiled down to first, it was like 12 concepts. And it was like, no, actually these three, these two could actually go to, these two are real similar. Wait, these two are similar. So I ended up coming up with nine behaviors. And it was again, after doing the research, because we believe everything is either about quantitative or qualitative research. We help our organizations lead the clients we work with, lead with data, data either from a qualitative side where we listen to employees or they look at their surveys or we read the comments, right? Um, they do coffees, they do round tables, they do leadership things that they, that they have their team members at the table. Um, they do surveys, all of that, but they listen, they start with data, that day, that input into their mind and the inputs into their hearts helps them, them display more heart through their leadership. So they, once they understand, they hear the stories, they, they see the comments, they build up an empathy muscle. They start to grow in empathy for what their people are going through because they're often very distant from them. So if, if they, we can bring them closer by letting them understand their experiences through their stories, through their comments, things like that, um, and we synthesize it, it helps then for them to be crystal clear about what it is they need to do to improve the experience for the many. So you say nine behaviors, you know, obviously we, you, you know, we want people to go, you know, go buy your book and read it, but what's one of the, what's, what's a behavior that people would, could do right now? Yeah. Oh, I'll give, I mean, let me, let me go to go to what I'm talking about right now, which is listening. Like as a manager, if we're talking about just at a manager level, some as a manager who's listening to us right now, they are, um, they have more control than they, than they think you have more control than you think. If you're listening to this, you have more influence and power than you think. And I'm talking about in a positive way. I'm not saying control and authority and power and you reign over people. Well, you know what? I would say reign over people in a positive way by showering them with recognition. I would say sitting with them and spending the one-on-one -on -one time with them where you go deeper. It's not just about what they can do for you. It's about what it is you can do for them, how you can do things together and you, how you can achieve more. It's about digging deeper to find out what the greatness is inside of them that maybe they haven't uncovered yet. Maybe you uncover it. Understanding their motivations, listening deeply and empathizing with them. Again, all of these things produce the emotions and the people that makes them want to go over and above love for you and the organization. I've known some leaders who really do that well, and not all of them succeed as leaders. And I started to see that one of the biggest differences between leaders who do that really well and how it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one relationship of whether or not they're succeeding as leaders is some of them are missing that, that accountability piece. You know, they, they over index on empathy and on what you can do for the, for the, the employees. And in fact, you know, even t uh, two weeks ago, I did a, a thoughtful Thursday episode on this podcast on, um, on the, the X, Y axis of psychological safety and performance accountability and how a lot of leaders over index on psychological safety and they end up in, the, in that comfort zone area, as opposed to the learning zone area. And those are, those aren't my words, but, but, you know, part of what you can, you, what you're supposed to do for your employees is to open up opportunities for them. And if there isn't a high level of performance accountability, you're not going to have opportunities as a team and, and therefore as individuals. So, you know, the leaders that, that hear this and they go, yes, I care. Well, do you care so much that you are not holding your people accountable? I mean, what, how does that look? Yeah. And that's, you bring up a good point. And that is one of the, the behaviors is setting it clear expectations about what it is you expect. And, but then of course, involving them in the process of how to get there. So that setting clear expectations is a big part of that accountability factor, because once they're really clear about where you want them to, where you want them to end up and, but you give them flexibility on how they get there. And maybe you are there, you kind of, uh, they can check in with you. You're there again. I said, meet with them regularly to see if you can remove barriers if you can remove roadblocks, but at the same time, do you need to recalibrate? Those are all the things I think that are tied into accountability. Accountability doesn't 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 um, abdicate responsibility of the leader to actually be supportive in the process, right? So that's why I think uh, you're right. I 100% agree. You have to have that in there. And again, those are the things that I heard. I'm just sitting here listening to all those leaders and the things they did and how they came out of things and what they how they fit like 
fell that they, they, they would admit to falling and the ways that they would fall down often would be like going about it all themselves, like not involving the team at all. Um, yes, not being clear about expectations um, and what it is that needed to happen at the end, but also not involving the team in that journey and what it should be and not trusting them to do what they need to get done and not checking in with them. So there's so many um, different facets to it, which again, I do make sure I highlight because I think it's not just the big picture. It's all the different little steps along the way peppered in with the stories of the people who are living it. Because, you know, what I found is that in this stuff, like we can talk about, we can talk into a tunnel. Like I can just be talking and like, you don't even have to be on this call, right? I just be talking and you can just be talking. But in the end, if we aren't living the experience, we're just philosophers, right? And that's why it's like so important with you and I to be talking about talking to people who were living the experience. And then for me, it was like, I need to synthesize these lived experiences in ways that help other people uh, leaders who are and managers, supervisors and above who are struggling with this. Like, okay, why am I not? It seems I am caring. Like I am empathizing and I'm meeting where they're at, but why aren't they getting stuff done? Well, am I setting clear expectations? Do, do, are they really clear about our why and our vision for where we're going? Are they really clear about the, basically the timeline for getting this done and what we expect to get done? And do they know that they can rely on me to be in their corner if they make thoughtful, take thoughtful risks? Right. So there's all these things, these questions that we have to ask ourselves in this process. And I do think that, you know, what you've uh, highlighted is an important part of that. There are so many employees out there who have never gotten that from a leader that they almost don't know how to react when they do see it. It's just so foreign a concept to them that I think it is um, it's looked at almost cynically, almost like there's no way this is real. Therefore, there's something else that I and I think, you know, obviously time time heals all right. You know, you do it on a long enough timeline. People start to actually believe you. But but I, I see some leaders who are trying to make strides in this space and because and, and they just don't have the stamina to do it through the time where employees are are almost hostile in reaction to it because they don't view it as as real they view it as almost like a you're you're patronizing me you're 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 trying to do this not because you actually care but because you're trying to get more out of me and i see through right i see right through this you know and so they give up they they go back to the way they were doing things after a short period of time of you know a month or a few quarters or whatever and um and and it's just it's unfortunate um but I, I, there's this kind of this almost a requirement to say, you know what, you have to take one step backward if you want to take several steps forward in this journey. And I, I, that's where I see a lot of leaders fail is when they, they don't just kind of stick with it and keep pushing. That is true, but you can't fake caring. You can't fake leading with her. You just can't fake it. So what I would say is that I, foundationally, you have to um, care for others. Like you have to you have to say, I don't want you as my brother and sister on this earth. Uh, like, right, just generally loosely, I don't, I wouldn't want you to be run out of my car. Like, I'd actually would like to see if there's a way for I, for I can, that I could help you. Like, you know what I mean? Foundationally, you have to have that. If, if you don't have that, and you're just like, I gotta give a care about that person, this person. And then you come like talk, listen to us on the show. It's going to be like hogwash. And I don't, it's not for you. So what we're saying right now is not for that person. What we're talking about is people who at least fundamentally have like decent human um, relations with people and feel like like human, the dignity of the human person should be like uplifted so that the person can go to work and feel safe. The person can go to work and feel like their work is meaningful, right? Like that we we have the, and even if we don't know how to get there, we have this belief that like maybe we can do that kind of thing. Like, you know, we, we have to have that kind of person in order to even take on the stuff we're talking about. Otherwise, it's going to be fake and they are going to sniff you out. They're going to sniff you out because it's fake. So until you can ever get to the point where you have like a wake up call, that says, how much do I actually express care to people? Like, how much do I actually care if that person exists? <laughs> right? Like, like, how much do, outside of what they can do for me? How much do I care? And if the answer is like, not a whole bunch, actually, then I, again, don't try to fake it because it's never going to go over. I think it's a great point because I don't think everybody is there naturally. I think there are very few people who just don't care about people at all. Like, they're just. Yeah, I, I think people like that end up kind of maybe gravitating away from a workforce where you're working alongside a lot of other people. It would just be too difficult for them if they truly, you know, wouldn't wouldn't miss a beat of their heart if, if someone got run over by a car. If it's that bad, I think a lot of people, and I'll put myself into this category too. I find it much easier to be the uplifting. The I, I want to see everything you can do, and I want to I want to put myself into helping you get there. If I genuinely care about a person and I can't genuinely care about a person simply because they're a person, it doesn't matter who they are, or what their background is. I, I have to connect with them in some way. 
I think a lot of people feel the same way. A lot of people, the reason why they aren't naturally doing this for their people is because they don't feel some sort of inherent connection to each of their people. And I'm not saying that's a, that's a, a cop. They, they don't get to, they don't get off the hook for that, but it's, it's a reason it's an explanation. And, and so, you know, when, in my own leadership journey, I found myself that my, a, a prerequisite for me is I, I had to spend time with people outside the context of, of work. I had to just like go sit and have a beer with them or have a conversation with them about their goals and dreams, not in the context of what I could do for them, but just who are you? Who are you? Why do you, why do you exist? Let me tell you why I exist. You tell me why you exist. What do you want from life, from yourself, your family, if you have family, if you're your, your spouse or your partner or your kids, whatever it is, what kind of music do you like? The, the simple stuff like that. And the more that I could do that with a person, the more kind of jumping off points I found. And then it became so much easier to do that kind of work. You know, I, I don't know how people do it without that. I just never could. You know, and good for you because a lot of leaders don't do that. So I like hats off to you for seriously. I mean, it's part of the part, part of the things I recommend all the time and I'm talking about and it's not rocket science. This stuff is not rocket science. I wish I could say I'm like, I'm totally original. <laughs> This is not original. This is just not the common practice. But the fact that you're doing it, again, hats off. A lot of people, are, a lot of managers are not doing that. They're, they're very uncomfortable um, meeting their people where they're at outside of work or even being in work with them but talking about things that are outside of work. You know, um, a, a family member is home. They have COVID. They're dying. They're sick. Uh, someone has mental health issues. They know it. They know they know they actually have uh, generalized um, anxiety disorder. They have bi bipolar. And because the HR stuff, everyone was like so afraid to talk about it. But you have to be able to say, OK, figure out what the context is, figure out the, what the words are. But you're still going to have to check in on them. You know, be OK with getting a hand slap because in the end, you have to check on your people mentally. You have to you, they have you have to know they're OK. So I, I'm with you. And I think the connection part, which I I definitely highlight it's super important. Um, they can't trust you. So you can't trust them. You can't care for them. They can't trust you. All these things if there's no connection. Right. So if you aren't spending that time, it's kind of like an elixir for everything else, right? Is having that trust and that connection built. Yeah. I mean, it can't start with questions about them. It has to start with talking. I mean, you say you talk about it's about listening. And I agree. I think listening is very important. But I think when there's a lack of trust, not because something bad happened, but just because there's no time, there's no relationship, that, that kind of lack of trust. You have to start as a leader by 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 dis, uh, by displaying the behaviors that you're hoping to get from your people. And so, you know, if it, if it means that you're trying to get them to open up to you, you have to start by being vulnerable with them. So instead of it's, you know, what can I do to help your generalized anxiety disorder? It's, hey, I just want to let you know, you don't have to, I'm not looking for an answer for you now. I just want to let you know that based on what happened yesterday, I I think I can relate. Let me tell you what happened to me six years ago or, or, or whatever it was. Um, so I, I feel what you're going through right now. If you ever want to talk about it, my door is always open and, 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 and leave it at that. And, and it could be as simple as that. And you might not get through to somebody based on that. But even though, yes, it's important to listen, you, you, can't, you can't listen until the person actually wants to talk to begin with. And they won't necessarily want to talk to you and become vulnerable in a way that really builds the relationship until they see that from you first as the leader. Yeah. And I do think, I mean, so I think the foundation of listening is absolutely a trust building. So if you haven't, and you, and you can't build trust unless you do what you say you're going to do, you, um, you know, so basically holding on to your promises, right? Uh, be, being congruent in who you are. So if you say, I value this, and then you go do something against that, and they see that, you've just broken trust. But if you actually say, I value that, and you go do that thing, now you've just built trust. So there's all these different steps you can do. You, you're right. You have to build trust before the listening happens. Like for us, this whole idea of creating safe spaces, particularly in the DEI space, you, you can't do that until you've built trust. So when I, they, they hire us because they haven't built trust. I mean, that's the really the gist of it. And so because we're, we're known for this, then they, they hire us because people will trust an outsider more than they will the insider. I think you know this is just the way it is. You know, the inside the inside the organization, if you haven't built that, then they'd rather talk to some stranger. Um, so I think those those are really critical. But that, so the, for me, the listening is the crux. But before you can listen internally effectively, you had to build trust. So if a leader is walking through the airport um, and they see your book on the shelf and they pick it up and they they see the the outside of it and they go, well, duh, you know, and they pick it up and they just kind of are thumbing through it. What what are they going to what are they going to see as they're flipping through pages that, that might make them go, hmm, OK, there's some there's more to this besides just telling me how I need to be more empathetic or telling me what I need to do, need to do better 
through the lens of somebody else, there, there's data here, there's metrics here, there's ways to kind of take this back and say, all right, how do I find out if my my direct reports, the C-suite is aligned with me? What are, what are the things they're gonna see in your book that kind of would, would lead them that down that path? I think there's two things. One is that it's not just Heather talking, sharing my own personal story, my philosophy of life and leadership. It's a whole bunch of other leaders from, I am telling you, probably every every type of industry you can even put your finger on and in multiple different countries. And they're talking about the things they've done and they're talking to you about the results. The other thing I think you're, you're I know you're gonna see is I've shared multiple stories of leaders, private and public sector, uh, those that are publicly traded, those that are privately held, uh, nonprofit. I've shared stories of successes and, and this is when they decided to shift from a um, numbers RRI focus to a people first strategy to a uh, human to human relationship leading with heart strategy at an organizational level. I actually share their numbers and it is amazing. There's a CEO of WD40 company, $2 billion market cap after he did it over about a 10 year period after he changed the entire focus of the business to be more focused on people. Uh, The CEO of Service Express, the same exact type of growth, I mean, crazy growth, but it was like, they had to almost smack themselves in the face to realize like, duh, I can't just be sitting people in front of me and talking about a project and this and that. And I haven't even stopped for a second and asked them how they're doing for goodness sakes. You know what I mean? It's just like the duh, I totally get the duh factor. So I actually want you to say duh and then I want you to read it and then I want to see what you come away with. You're going to be like, okay, there's some meat on this. There's some, there's something here. And then again, afterward, they get a, they get a whole support system. So they get a self-assessment they get to take. They get a caring leadership community. They get an academy that helps them. So they are not alone. We are not, none of us are alone on this journey to caring leadership, to leading period, leading with heart. So I agree with you completely. If there was one takeaway you wanted our listeners to get from this, um, from this interview, listening to you talk and assuming they, they haven't bought the book yet and they're not about to, they, they either, they're not in a position where they can hire your company or that's not, they're not a decision maker, but they want to show up to work today and just do better by their people, something concrete that's more than just you should listen to your people more. They know they should listen to their people more if they're not, if they're not already. Um, what's something they can take away from this that they can you know, potentially put into practice either today or tomorrow? Well, I mean, here's something. I, 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 I'm a very pensive person and I like people to reflect. I think, again, I think we learn through reflection and we don't take enough time to reflect on just what's happening around us. So I would say this, that caring leadership is about showing concern and kindness for those you lead. And it is about showing it. It's about expressing it. So I would say, ask yourself, in what ways today or tomorrow Will you go into work and express concern and kindness for those you lead? Um, and and be specific. Write it down. Uh, for Sarah, I'm going to do this because this happened. For Joe, I know that this happened, and so I'm going to do this. Uh, so write it out and make it real and, and definitive. But I would say reflect first because, again, reflection is, man, it's an art form. It really helps to reveal so much. And writing down too. Our, our, our thought, our, our, our one minute hacks every episode I'll almost always start with, you know, uh, get out your pen and paper and write this down. We Believe me, we, we are wholeheartedly in the camp of writing things down, journaling, reflecting. Um, yeah, you don't have to sell me on that stuff here. Um, Heather, it, it was such a pleasure having you on the show. Uh, we really enjoyed this here. I think our listeners are going to enjoy it too. Um, you know, what What would you like our listeners to do for you? What, what What can they do? Your book came out yesterday. Yes. Oh my gosh, what a journey. You know, it's it's uh, so it's called The Art of Caring Leadership. The website is called theartofcaringleadership.com. And so they can go there. There's bundles there. So if they really love this concept and they, they download the first chapter there and they're like, oh my gosh, I have got to get this for my team. I have bundles for teams in there. So you get like cool... Uh, gimmies and free things. And if you are like a really big company and you buy uh, 750, you get a free keynote. And if you buy, you know, uh, I think it's like 250 or something, you get 30 minutes of me as the author on the call with you. So there's a lot of cool things if you decide that you want to really make this like big for the team in your organization. I love that. I love it. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And I hope uh, our paths cross again in the future. Thank you, Chris.